Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel, and today's topic of discussion is air piloted valves. Our objective is to examine air piloted directional control valves in pneumatic systems. This lecture operates under the presumption that viewers watch the pneumatic directional control valves lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched this lecture yet or only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now and return to this lecture when you are so qualified. You recall, in the aforementioned lecture, we discussed manual, mechanical, and electrically actuated pneumatic directional control valves in some level of detail, but I admittedly kind of left you hanging with respect to air piloted valves. Well, today I intend to rectify that impasse and talk your ears off about air piloted valves. Viewers that have slogged through the hell of the hydraulics playlist might recall that I kind of just wave my hands and passingly refer to oil-based hydraulically piloted valves, but I never really go into any detail about them, for good reason. At risk of setting the internet on fire, I will so boldly proclaim that oil-based pilot systems absolutely disgust me and I hate working on them. And this is coming from a guy that loves hydraulics. Don't get me wrong here. Hydraulics are the systems of choice for certain applications and for those specific applications, I get super excited. And when I say excited, I mean really excited, like heart beating harder and my respiration increases type of excitement. But to make hydraulics do something it doesn't do well, when there are so many other better choices, I get super pissed off and I start headbutting walls, doors, and people. Hydraulics does one thing well, and no other system does it better. Seriously, none. Moving a tremendous load is not an extraordinary feat, and any number of different types of systems can do that. Lifting the load and then locking it in place and just staying there, that's the challenge. This is what hydraulics do well, principally because of liquid's incompressible nature. To accentuate my point about this, I'm asking the viewer to keep this lecture playing, get out of your chair, get off your couch or whatever, and stand on one leg and extend the other leg straight out, and then stand there, and stand there, and stand there. Stand like a statue. If you're not a wimp, grab a 50-pound slam ball and hold it over your head and stand there, and stand there, and stand there. Get my point? The best type of system to move a load and lock it in place is a hydraulic one, principally because of liquid's incompressible nature. But... To suggest that hydraulics is the best choice for any and all applications is seriously flawed. Hydraulics excels at brute lifting or crushing strength. To suggest that this same raw power also be used for control is akin to using a 3.5 inch 12 gauge shell filled with 2 ounces of number 4 lead shot to kill a hummingbird. Even if one was capable of overlooking the obvious over overkill, hydraulic systems are undoubtedly dirty, messy, greasy oily, heavy, and present contamination, slip, and fire hazards. The last thing you want in a hydraulic system is more hydraulics. Again, this is coming from a guy that loves hydraulics. For this reason, if any desire of precise control is desired in a system that must also exert the strength of a silverback, my immediate choice would not be an entirely hydraulic nor an entirely electrical system, but rather an electrically controlled hydraulic system. Hydraulics provides the necessary brute strength, whereas the electrical ladder logic and solenoid actuated directional control valves provides the timely, efficient, and precise control of such strength. It is the best of both worlds. Strength without the sloppiness and speed without weakness. This being said, those technicians that service electrically controlled hydraulic systems must necessarily be conversant in both languages, hydraulics and electrical control. Given the topic of this lecture is air piloted valves, it might seem like this rant about hydraulics and electrical controlled systems is somewhat divergent, but I'm hoping to tie it together with this astute observation. This mismatch between primary and pilot or power control does not exist in pneumatic systems. And one may encounter pneumatic systems entirely controlled by air pilots without the necessity or expense of electrical control. In summary, the medium to light duty nature of pneumatics is a perfect match for both primary power and pilot control. Additionally, Air piloted directional control valves offer distinct advantages in pneumatic systems. Allow me to demonstrate. Consider a normally closed, push button operated 3x2 directional control valve used to control a spring retracted, pneumatically extended single acting cylinder. Let's say, for safety reason, the operator station needs to be some distance from the actuator. In the deactivated state, the cap end is exhausted to atmosphere, and the cylinder is retracted by the spring in the rod end. When an operator presses the push button, the valve moves into a position such that pressurized flow is routed to the cap end. Given the long, long length of line between the pneumatic source directional control valve and actuator, 
One might expect significant pressure losses in the line, such that the single acting cylinder extends weakly and slowly, if at all. Here's an example of this flawed system. I'm simulating the separation distance between the source and actuator with a huge coil of hose. When I press the push button, the cylinder does extend, but it does so with the eagerness of an eight-year-old shaking off a sugar rush the day after Halloween. For this reason, rather than directly controlling the single acting cylinder, one might consider relocating the source closer to the actuator and indirectly controlling it using an air-piloted, normally closed 3x2 directional control valve. Instead of a manual actuator, this valve makes use of an air pilot to shift the spool. At the operator station, still some distance from the actuator as required for safety concerns, another push-button operated, normally closed 3x2 directional control valve, instead of opening and closing the primary passage, and directly actuates the air piloted directional control valve closer to the actuator. You note the large separation distance still implies the dash pilot line will experience pressure losses and consequent reduction of flow rate, but who cares? It's a pilot line. It only needs the tiniest, weakest puff of air to shift the tiny spool. In the deactivated state, the cap end is exhausted at atmosphere and the cylinders are retracted by the spring in the rod. When an operator presses the push button, a pilot signal is sent to the air pilot on the left hand side. The air piloted valve moves into a position such that pressurized flow is routed at the cap end. Given the cloak's proximity of the relocated pneumatic source, the system does not experience any significant pressure losses in the line such that the single acting cylinder extends with the requisite strength and speed. Here's an example of the reconfigured system. Again, the huge coil of hose simulates the separation distance between the push button operated valve and the air piloted valve. This being said, the source is now much closer to the actuator. When I press the push button, it sends a tiny, tiny puff of air to the air piloted directional control valve, which is all it needs to shift the spool such that the cylinder extends with the necessary strength and speed. In summary, air piloted valves don't need a lot of pressure nor flow to move a tiny spool. All they need is the tiniest puff of air to change position. Pilot systems are exactly that. Low pressure, low flow rate control signals used to direct the high pressure, high flow rate primary system. As a means of reinforcing this point, consider a double acting cylinder directly controlled by two normally closed push button operated 3x2 directional control valves both some distance from the actuator. When an operator presses push button one on the left, the cylinder does extend, but extends slowly and weakly due to the pressure losses in the line feeding the cap end. To compound this poor performance, the line exhausting the rod end encounters a lot of resistance such that the cylinder is doubly slow and doubly weak. The same poor performance is experienced during retraction. When an operator releases push button one and presses push button two on the right, the cylinder does retract, but it retracts slowly and weakly due to the pressure losses in the long line feeding the rod end. To compound this poor performance, the line exhausting the cap end encounters a lot of resistance such that the cylinder retracts doubly slow and doubly weak. One means of correcting this flaw is with the use of a double air piloted 5x3 directional control valve indirectly controlled by two normally closed push button operated 3x2 directional control valves still the requisite distance from the actuator. When an operator presses push button one on the left, it sends a tiny puff of air to the air pilot on the left hand side, shifting the air piloted valve into a position such that pressurized input one is routed to actuator port four and actuator port two is vented to exhaust port three. Given negligible losses in the short primary lines, the cylinder extends with undiminished strength and speed. The same can be said for retraction. When an operator releases push button one and presses push button two on the right hand side, it sends a tiny puff of air to the air pilot on the right hand side, shifting the valve into a position such that the pressurized input port 1 is routed to actuator port 2 and actuator port 4 is vented to exhaust port 5. As with extension, given negligible losses in the short primary lines, the cylinder retracts with undiminished strength and speed.